there is a weakness among members of the church from this standpoint. We would like to see all of the good that God wants done, done while we're on the earth. And it's hard sometimes for us to think about, after all of us are gone, that anybody else would carry on the work of the church. Well, that should not be that way, although we should be greatly concerned that others would be taught the truth, and certainly in succeeding generations, people would love the truth and teach it and defend it. But we must not reach the stage of thinking that those today who are sound in the faith and very capable preachers and teachers and elders and deacons and so on, that when they're gone, there just won't be anybody to carry the truth out. In listening to older preachers when I was a young preacher, now well over 50 years ago, I would hear them say the same things, that when they were growing as a preacher that they wondered who would take the place of those fellows that were well known and that they had learned from and they had supported. And I'm quite persuaded because of our human nature and that we all operate the same way while we're on the earth that that's always been the case with people who loved the truth, lived it, and wanted to do all they could while they were here to further the cause of Jesus Christ. When I read in Genesis 18, 19, the words that are given to us by the inspired Moses, I find these words from God concerning faithful Abraham. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken unto him. Well, there's a lot in that, and it's far beyond just the historical personage of the man. Abraham, that God has selected, is the example of faithful service to him. God, who knows all that is the object of knowledge, that is, he's omniscient, knew Abraham and knew how he would operate. He was not forced against his will to be what the Bible records him to be, but it was because Abraham wanted to be what the Bible says he was that God was able to use him and God could select him as an example of faithful obedience to him in all things. And yet there is brought out in this statement that God knew what he would do. But we must understand today if God's people are not taught of God's own concern and his providential care of those who love and keep his commandments, then there will be a falling away, there will be a chaos, there will be disaster that follows. There's another indication of how he expects succeeding generations to be taught the truth by those that live today. And it's found in Exodus 1, verses 6 and 8. Scripture says concerning Joseph, and he died. And there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now, when you read through in Genesis all about Joseph and his great faithfulness, his purity, and how God used him in the divine scheme of things, we see that he had made great provisions for Egypt. He was important in the history of Egypt, regardless of his place in the development of the scheme of redemption. And as long as it was published abroad about his connection with all he had done for Egypt, then you find that Israel was highly favored being that those were the people Joseph came from and caused to come down into the land of Goshen. 
But now after Joseph died, it was no longer taught, it was no longer published in the teaching of the history of that nation about Joseph. And soon the Israelites were subject to slavery and bondage. Israel failed in so many ways in the same way when you read about them. It doesn't take long in reading Joshua and the end of the Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel and so on, to see that succeeding generations of Israelites would forget God. While there may have been some, and there were, that loved the Lord and kept His commandments no matter what, there would be a generation rise that did not remember for whatever reason, more than likely had been taught. And thus we see a need that the church has in teaching the succeeding generations. Now long before Jerusalem was destroyed, it was plundered, the temple was ravaged and torn down, God had made provision for a restoration through a remnant of faithful Jews of Jerusalem and the temple. And here's what happens when you read of the order that he gave to Jerusalem, or he tells us in that order what would happen. Walk about Zion and go about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well the bulwarks. Consider her palaces. Now watch. That ye may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Psalm 48, 12 through 14. It is incumbent upon us in spiritual Israel to continue to teach the truth of God's word no matter what takes place. The church itself is primarily a teaching institution. It was put here on this earth to save souls by preaching the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, to every creature. That's the way God has seen fit to do it. Now, going back to fleshly Israel, Israel was to look intently on the beauty and the strength and the safety that God had afforded them through their love of Him and their faithful obedience to His will. They were to view the glory of the temple and they were to realize it was there because they were God's covenant people. He had a purpose for them. Now they misused and abused that and had a concept that since the temple's here, we can live any way we want to, regardless of what the loss is, and God will be with us. And of course, that's that was just wrong as it could be. They were to look upon the resplendence of the towers and the bulwarks as yet not scarred nor defaced because they would apostatize. God would punish them for it. They were to behold the beauty and they were to behold the palaces for they had not yet been destroyed by them or that is their enemies as God used them to punish unfaithful Israel. They were to walk around the city itself and look at it from the standpoint of details and even a panoramic view of Jerusalem. It was the city of their God. It existed because God wanted it to exist and wanted it to exist for the benefit of the Jews. But then after they had done all of this, what does the psalmist say? You're to tell it to succeeding generations. Now long before there was a Jerusalem and a temple, if you go back to the very beginnings, before they had any concept as the Jews of a great nation, though they had been promised that to Abraham and God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12, 
always there is the underlying idea of teach those who come after you. It may be, and I've seen this even in preachers, that because the fundamentals are so familiar to some that it seems that if you preach on those first principles and fundamentals that people are going to become bored. But there are people who haven't heard them. They're fresh and they're new and they're foundational for people to have in their minds that they can grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And unless they have that foundation well set in their minds, they're not going to grow as they ought to. Israel was, as I've said several times already, and Bible students know this, was soon taken into Babylonian captivity because of their long occurring sins of which they would not repent. And there in that far off place among a people that was foreign to them with the foreign language and customs, they, many of them, simply forgot Zion. So listen to what we might say is the forlorn captives' lamentations for their beloved city as some of them remembered what things had been. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then the question, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Psalm 137, 1 through 6. Now let's pause here and think for a moment. What good are those words to us today? As Christians, members of the church of Christ. Well, Paul says of all the Old Testament, Romans 15 and verse 4, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Well, the Scriptures referred to by Paul are the Old Testament Scriptures, and I just read one of them. And that should cause members of the church who understand spiritual Israel its organization, its work, its worship, individual Christian living. It should cause us to want to see the church as strong as possible. And that means want, wanting to see each member of the church as knowledgeable of the truth and practicing it as they possibly can. So that generation had been told and they lamented it. Maybe not all, but some did. They knew why they were in Babylon. They couldn't pass the buck. It was their fault. They had been hard-hearted and refused to repent. And they were receiving their just deserts. But they didn't forget Zion. God took care of all of that in His providential development of Israel. And God is still in control today. He moved the heathen rulers of that time to send those Jewish, at least a remnant of them, captives back to the city of Jerusalem and to restore the temple and rebuild the walls. And we read of that when we read of faithful Ezra and Nehemiah. And there were many of them who followed them back. And they went to the city and they did just that. 
They rebuilt it. They rebuilt the walls. They rebuilt the temple. They restored it. Now, in the afternoon, I started a while back, a couple of Sundays ago, a study of the New Testament uh, teaching concerning the restoration of primitive, pure New Testament Christianity. I mentioned at that time the seed principle. And by that, we meant that everything produces after its kind. You plant a watermelon seed, you get a watermelon plant, and if it grows normally and produces, it cannot help but produce watermelons. The same is true of anything with a seed. It produces after its kind. And the Lord in Luke 8 verse 11 said, The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And thus, there are no Christians fruit where the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, has not gone. Where men have not studied it. Men have not understood it. And men have not believed it. If the church today is to remain the church that, of, by, that is of, by, and for Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father and the salvation of the souls of men, it must remember these fundamental things and do its best to communicate to those that follow the truth of which we speak. Once, a long time ago now, to me it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was, I looked upon with my own eyes the Mount of Olives out over Gethsemane. And across the brook Kidron in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And looked at the walls of Jerusalem. Now those walls were the walls that were built there. Except for some in foundation by the people who were the crusaders. I saw, and I'm sure you've seen on television, the Dome of the Rock, which is the Mosque of Omar, which stands now on the Temple Mount where Solomon's Temple once stood. Late one afternoon, I walked about the Temple area, doing my best to recall all I could of the Bible about such things. I noted the towers of that time, and I noted the bulwarks over against the eastern gate that's closed now. I thought of the things the Bible had to say about that. And those are things I'm glad to remember, and I was very glad to visit those places where so much took place and is recorded in the Bible and where our Lord himself walked and taught and where the church began. It was a privilege to assemble with the church in Jerusalem early on a Sunday morning and worship God. Those things are sentimental things to us because wherever we are in the world and we're walking according to the authority of Christ, there is God. And we must realize that spiritual Israel remains faithful to God in the only way it can. That is being taught the truth and living according to the truth. Wherever the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, the truth of Christ, the gospel goes, men humbly and honestly receive it and understand it and obey it. There is spiritual Israel. So it's not the literal city of Jerusalem that is of such vital interest to Christians. And again, I say the word Christian, not as it's bandied about a lot today, but as it's defined and used in the New Testament. Listen to what is said in Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 23. Speaking of Christians and to Christians, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, 
and to the spirits of just men made perfect. When you reflect upon what that verse and others like it teach, and you are a member of the Lord's church, a Christian, one who is of Christ, there's so much to cause one to rejoice in reading that. The spirits of just men made perfect. God has a way of taking the old rank sinner and making him as if he had never sinned. He doesn't do it against that old rank sinner's will, but he does it because that person is willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save his soul, and so he does. And he obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ Baptized in the Christ as a penitent believer and raised to walk in newness of life. A new creature in Christ, well, to be in Christ, is where God has located every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Forgiveness of sin, sonship, and the expectation of glory when this life is over. The spirits of just men made perfect. Zion of old was often as you read your Old Testament, you see this in bondage. And it faced various sieges. But the scripture reads in Galatians 4.26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and the mother of us all. A Christian's love and devotion is not to a literal city such as the Jerusalem that exists over there today and has existed for many, many years. That city that sits among the Judean hills. But it is the spiritual Israel, the church of the Lord. The church of Christ was established even as decreed by the prophets. Isaiah, we studied not long ago, in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, and Daniel 2, 44, made that very clear that the house of God, which is the church of the living God, Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, 15, the pillar and ground of the truth. It is the kingdom of God that is established and will not be moved. It was also promised by our Lord himself in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. And he said to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom using church and kingdom interchangeably to refer to the same institution of the saved. Then that first Pentecost, following the resurrection and ascension of Christ, we see these things fulfilled, these marvelous statements. And men were saved by obedience to the gospel when they believed in Christ, repented of their sins, and were baptized for the remission of their sins. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized Acts 2, 38 and 41 and 47. He added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Christ is given and so he is as the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And Colossians 1, verse 18. And any church that declares itself to belong to God and is acceptable to God, but does not have Christ as its head, is simply not the church Jesus built. Christ is the Savior of his spiritual body, but that body is the church, Ephesians 5.23. No wonder then that we find on the birthday of the church in Acts 2 that the inspired Luke records that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He gave himself for that church. Who did? Christ did, Ephesians 5.25. He purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. So we learn from the scriptures that God was glorified in the church by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. Many people talk about glorifying God. Many who say Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible is the Word of God and God is our Father. And they'll say glory to God, glory to God. But God is glorified in one way and one way only. By people who love him and from the heart 
obey his will. No other way is God glorified. Thus, Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. That statement is not made of any other people other than those of the obedient class. Having been purposed by God, purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, and now guided by the Holy Spirit in the inspired scriptures, Ephesians 6, 17, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that church had not one flaw. It has not one blemish. It has not one fault. For as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. It would do good to remind ourselves, though I mentioned it before, that in the original Greek, the present tense is used, and present tense there is described as linear action. You simply draw a line. It keeps on going. And thus, when you're baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, the blood of Christ was shed in his death. It's applied to you. Your sins are remitted. Your past sins are. And as you continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, guess what? The blood continues to wash away our sins. And we understand even as Christians when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. He'll plead our case. If we're humble, we will repent of our sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. 1 John 1 and verse 8. We have such a wonderful thing to preserve us to the heavenly realms. And we need to teach one another these things, remind one another of these things in the midst of a pernicious and crooked generation. This world is not our home. As the song says, we're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up beyond the blue. Our hope is in glory in heaven. And to be there someday, forever, we must walk the straight and narrow way of truth. In Psalm 132, 13, the scripture reads, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. And how we should treasure this divine institution that God has made possible for us in the divine scheme of things. Now the only way that people are going to know about it is for us to equip ourselves to teach it to one another and to the generations to follow. We're always just one single solitary generation away from apostasy. It doesn't make any difference how much everybody in this room knows the truth, how well we practice it in our day-to-day -day living, how well we defend it and proclaim it. If we do not teach it to those to follow, it'll be lost in just one generation. And thus, for us to play a part in the great scheme of things as God intended, we must therefore be faithful and commit ourselves totally to the little time we have left here to spread the gospel, to use whatever power of physical strength and mental strength we have to submit to God and to teach the truth by being an example of godly living before everybody else, the salt of the earth, the leavening of good, the light of the world, but then in the absolute teaching of the word. If we do that, then we shall be in heaven with him, and there will be no way we can figure at this point how many we will take with us. So with the prophet we say to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no life in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. We have the absolute infallible standard of conduct for us to live by. It is the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. 
Jesus said plainly, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We ought to be like those in, right after the church was established when they said, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And then we find it said of them, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And then it says they, in, under persecution even, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We're commissioned to do that anyway, Mark 16, 15. They did it, we can do it, and we must do it if heaven is to be our eternal home. The obligation to teach others was so pressing that the great apostle Paul said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. In some way or the other, to one extent or the other, how can a person wear the name Christ and not have that same disposition of mind toward those lost in sin who are opposing themselves, and that's most of the world, and who are actually antagonists of the cause of Christ. Those people of the first century that we read of in the Bible, our brethren of so long ago, taught the generation following, even when it was warned, by the Holy Spirit, they were that some would fall away. Some would not obey. Even in teaching people of that time, they warned that some would fall away. Well, the question is that we must ask ourselves, will I be one of those that fall away? Or will I persevere? Will I be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? For as much as I know, my labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Only you, only each one of us, we personally must resolve that I will use whatever time I have left on this earth, whether brief or long, to proclaim Christ and Him crucified and contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's what God calls on us to do. Less than that, and we will not be faithful according to our several abilities so to do. More than that, he does not ask of us. But that we must do. Time is swiftly passing. We know not when our day on earth will be our last day on earth. But it's coming. I've preached that since I was a young man. I certainly can preach it now that I'm an old man. Because it's been the truth all along. And there are many who, when we were young, that I think of now, who died when they were young. I can call names of people that were in my graduating class that in a matter of five years after we graduated from high school, they were dead. And in the next 20 years, several more were dead. Well, God has richly blessed me to live this long, and many of those to continue to live, and so you. But how much longer do we have? We don't know. Now, Let's take heart and rise up to do as generations before us have done who love the Lord and kept His commandments and teach the generation to follow. That the faith of God may be alive on this earth and that we will have done our part. That heaven will be our home when life's little day ends and the sun sets upon us. If you're not a child of God this morning, we plead with you, we beg you by the mercies of Christ to obey the gospel of Christ as we've studied it this morning. And before you leave here this day as a repentant believer, be immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of your past sins. Leave here a Christian to be able to use the rest of your life to grow in the grace and knowledge of God and in teaching others. As a child of God, have you let so many things slip? The days have come and gone, and you haven't grown as you know you should and could. We urge you, therefore, to repent of whatever's hindered you. Confess those sins and pray to God for forgiveness. 
The lovely and wonderful thing is, as long as time continues, Jesus stands beckoning, knocking at the door of our heart, wanting us to open it in obedience to him, and saying to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls. Are you subject to the great invitation of our Lord? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.